There he is. Yep. Hello. Hello. Yep. Making sure the Rumble chat's all good. How you doing? Broadcasting live from the Orenthal James Simpson funeral mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, Brentwood, California. I am your African American correspondent for the Unregistered Channel. I'm here with uh, our host, Michael Weimer, a uh, noted gang member. No, I um. Before we get into saying RIP to the king, you know that I th I threw a chair across my living room when he was acquitted. As, that's, as how I, that's how much I've changed. I used to be a self-hating <laughs> black man, and yeah. then I, I realized I got woke. I mean, that was in the 90s, right? And I got woke, so now I see. Mm -hmm. But anyway, before we do that, I was an amazing uh, night last night getting to get back into renegade history. Mm -hmm in the course at Unregistered Academy. And I just brought this up because several people have asked me if you can stream the course after the live sessions. And yes, absolutely. If you purchase the course, you can get uh, stream streaming videos of every session immediately after they happen. So yeah, and then we have three more live sessions. Um, so it's well worth it to jump in now um, or just become a streaming member of, of the Academy either way. So yes. Um, yeah, it was an amazing thing. And and OJ Simpson is a bit of a renegade, isn't he? <laughs> he's yeah, he's the he didn't set out renegade. to be. Yeah. What's that? He's the modern renegade. He's American folk hero, legend, renegade royalty. Well, hey, hang on now. So I didn't I didn't I distinct didn't I make this point to you the last week? Um mm -hmm. that my my renegade yes, there's renegades, but there's to me there's renegades who do things that are that violate the norms but don't produce anything that I value, you know, like murdering people. Um mm -hmm. then there's renegades like who I write about and teach about, um, you know, like the prostitutes of the 19th century who were renegades, obviously against many norms, but did things that women weren't allowed to do. And by doing so made it possible for women to walk in public alone, et cetera, et cetera. So OJ, um, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's such an odd, strange, macabre, dark story. Was it 94? Is that uh, yeah. 94? Yeah. And then he was acquitted in 95. Yeah. I watched every minute of the trial. I was fascinated by it and I got, to, I was able to watch all of it. And so Michael Tracy raises a, a really amazing, important, not amazing, a very important and good point on Twitter. He said this, that, you know, <laughs> uh, Mark Lamont Hill. No, Mark Lamont Hill made this point. My, okay. I apologize. I apologize. This is Mark. Tracy made some said something sort of similar, but not nearly as well crafted. Mark Lamont Hill made the most interesting argument, and I think maybe the best politically argument, maybe I gotta think through this, but uh about how to think about OJ Simpson and the trial in particular. So uh you can pull it up if you want, but like he says yeah. something the effect of um the state failed to prove its case. And I think that's right. And on top of that, he said, you know, that they there was uh, indisputably <laughs> a straight up real deal, old school racist cop who was one of the prime investigators, uh, Furman, Mark Furman, who I mean, like, there's no denying that the guy's like a real racist um, now lives in Idaho, <laughs> which is where when he moved there, I thought, oh, that's where all the racists go. It's true. Um that's a slander on some of my, I know some people like, you know, are big fans of Ruby Ridge, et cetera. <clears throat> Sorry about that. But it's just true. Those people, I, I, I love that they live in Idaho. I want them to live in Idaho. I want them to be completely unmolested in Idaho, but it's just a fact that a lot of like actual white supremacists in the seventies, eighties and nineties, Mark Furman being one of them moved to Kirtling, Idaho. That became like a thing. And if to this day, when you go there, there's a big contingent of that there. But anyway, um, yeah. So, I mean, the guy was obviously biased. He was the principal investigator. He easily could have planted evidence. He probably did plant evidence. And probably including did plant the, evidence, yeah. Yeah, including the glove. Um, and Johnny Cochran. I mean, by the way, you want to talk about black excellence. Johnny Cochran, especially in that trial, because he did a thing that I'm not sure I have seen which is to, you know, um, 
someone from the hood might say like he played the man's game and he played our game at the same time and won both of them meaning that he he did the forensic analysis he did the argumentation the logical argumentation he did all that and then he also did the black preacher thing um and he did both and but the thing is he did both totally effectively um it's like lamar jackson passing the ball just as well as he runs the ball it's that kind of thing um or, but or I mean, Simpson acting as well as he uh, ran the ball this by far has been our most racist episode i just want to say that so we're 14 no 10 not even nine minutes in no not even seven minutes in and just like it's like a clan meeting up in here <laughs> uh, um <laughs> but it was i mean i i think that actually it's sort of been underappreciated what johnny cochran did in that trial um because he played the man's game i'm not he a lot of people will dismiss him as just sort of like a huckster demagogue you know black preacher style or civil rights leader style but no 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 i mean the glove stuff the evidence stuff the blood stuff that was all really i mean that was top lawyering actually not just mm -hmm. not just speaking to a black jury we have we have a video i just watched one a video <laughs> we have videos i think i think it's now multiple jurors who have said on camera that they in fact voted to acquit simply as revenge for rodney king um mm -hmm. and then there's another there's one of the jurors who sa has said on camera to a news outlet um you can watch it it's on youtube that she thinks that 90 percent of the jury voted that way for that reason for revenge mm -hmm. and i you know that's what we all knew at the time because if you you young man weren't even born but uh but yeah, if you were if you were an adult, conscious adult at the time, and especially if you lived in the big cities at the time, which I did, um, live, I lived in New York at the time. I mean, Rodney King was epic. The riots and all of that was it was the first George Floyd. I mean, it was that it was that big, really. Um, and the LA riots were that destructive. I mean, even more destructive. I think more people, yeah, more people died in the LA riots than in all of the Floyd riots, I think, combined. I think it was in the six, was it 60 something people died? 30 something in LA? But it was a huge deal. And of course, for the lefties like me at the time, it was all about racist cops. Now, the thing is, back then in 94, that was actually true. Like the LAPD. I mean, we have we know this now. There's just tons and tons of evidence, not just racist, not just racist, but criminal gangsters. There's got there's like four or five LAPD doing life in in San Quentin as we speak because they 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 operated an entire drug and murder gang inside the LAPD in the Rampart Division. Sort of an infamous case um, that the L.A. city has tried to keep quiet. <laughs> since I think this happened in the 80s or 90s these guys were like murdering people and extorting them and selling drugs and and pimping out women and at the point of and like threatening them if they didn't comply with going to prison right like this was the ultimate criminal activity like imagine doing that with a cop's power which is what they did using a cop's power to run a criminal gang um that <laughs> I mean I know a lot of people will say well that's what a cop that's what cops are they're a criminal gang to begin with but I mean it's sort of a double effect of that but anyway that's that's what that place what that's what the lapd was as of 1991 um before rodney king up to rodney king and you know nwa is they're the people who let us know about it and so remember that that's a key piece of this straight out of compton drops in 1990 89 90. so and that album i am telling you <laughs> that that gripped the consciousness of any liberal white person in this country, um, especially young people. It was huge. And this is before the internet, right? This is when like albums were the big deal. Like everybody sort of, you would gather around albums and everyone would talk about and think about particular albums. And that was humongous for anybody who was like interested in black culture at all, or like sort of left wing at all. And that was early 90s. And then you got Rodney King. You see the videotape of him getting the shit kicked out of him, beaten out of him. 
way worse, way, way, way worse than what happened to Floyd, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was the brew that led to the riots. Because the riots, I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of it was in South LA. That's when it was called South Central. Now it's called South LA for some reason. But um, yeah, so um, it was seen, the riots were largely seen in my circles as justified. Mm -hmm. As not just justified. I mean, I had friends, I mean, this is pretty far left people, but still, I had many, I know of many people at the time who talked about it as um, straight up righteous vengeance. You know, I mean, they wouldn't mention what happened to Reginald Denny or all the Korean shopkeepers. Yeah. Was Reginald or, Denny the truck driver? Yeah. 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 And everyone uh, needs to watch that video. That's uh, what radicalized Jim Goad, and those riots radicalized a lot of other people uh, into yeah. racial, white racial consciousness. They yeah. saw, uh, yeah. they basically saw, uh, it doesn't matter what you say or what you do, you are still perceived as white. And at the end of the day, if a race war breaks out, your teams yeah. are already decided for you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm telling you, as a, as a white boy who grew up in California, and then also lived much on the East Coast and in New York, um, there's a strange thing. I don't know what that is exactly, but there is a thing on the West Coast uh, in West Coast cities. There is more of that sort of like reverse racist animosity. Um, there's some of it, certainly in New York, but here there's much more sort of like violent intention. And I think it's because it's enabled and encouraged by the white left here, which is mm -hmm. so powerful on the West Coast in terms of sort of determining culture. And like when I say that, I mean like the far left like the marxist left the cultural the woke left on the west coast actually does influence local politics and even state politics unlike in new york you know it's all liberals out there <clears throat> they're kind of holding the fortress of liberalism in the east coast but here i mean it's the dam has been broken um so oh yeah uh speaking of which eric adams uh, i don't have the clip but eric adams went on the breakfast club and he got grilled for <laughs> stop and frisk for doing more stop and frisk than uh oh, earlier yeah yeah. I love how I love how people on the left, the first thing they'll say about stop and frisk is it's not even effective. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> like what? <laughs> of course it's effective. It's erratically effective. If you stop and frisk every person the cops think might possibly be a criminal, of course you're gonna grab a lot of guns and stop a lot of crime. I mean, no shit. That's just the question is do you want to live in a totalitarian society that's super safe? And some people do. And I respect that choice, um, especially, you know, growing up around here and living in New York and L.A. for my entire life. Like, <laughs> but yeah, Reginald, I want to say real quickly about that video. If you haven't watched it, I mean, I. Uh, as a as a white boy who grew up in uh, integrated and sometimes largely black neighborhoods in California in the 70s and 80s. I would force everybody I'd grab him by the back of the head and make him watch Reginald Denny get the shit kicked out of him because to a lesser degree. That's what happened to me and my brother and much, many of my friends, but especially my brother and me, because we were the ones who lived in the hood. <laughs> we were the white kids who lived in the hood. But yeah, it wasn't nice. Integration, the, the untold, one of the, un, one of the big untold stories of integration, I've said this many times, was what happened to white kids um, in liberal cities. It wasn't pretty. That's and the as story. We that, about, as we've talked about Jewish kids. And the birth of neoconservatism. What's that? What's the comparison? Oh, we've talked about the birth of neoconservatism from uh, young little Jewish kids getting beaten up in integrated neighborhoods, or yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. And so, like Norman Podoritz and Irvin Kristol, that's what happened to them in Brooklyn forty yeah. years earlier. Um, and they became the neocons, the neoconservatives, because of it. I argue, and sort of they argue really too. They explicitly argue, yeah. Basically, that's what they say, yeah. Um, and decided to hate on brown people who didn't like Jews, including Palestinians. And so they made mm -hmm. that connection real quick. Before that, they didn't care about Israel. When the brown kids and the black kids started whooping their ass in the hood in Williamsburg, and uh, what was it? Fuck. Flatbush, not Flatbush, I forget the name, but uh, Brown, Brownsville, Brownsville. Um, then they decided to go all in on the Zionist project so they could kill some Arabs. I swear to God. I swear to God. <laughs> I mean, it's that's a little bit of a crude interpretation, but really that anyway. Um, so 
Norman Podoritz and Irving Kristol, who are the godfathers, the originators, the founders of neoconservatism. That's the Norman, Norman Podoritz wrote an amazing essay on this very topic called Our Negro Problem, or no, My Negro Problem and, and Ours. I think that's right. In commentary in 1960, early 60s, 63, 62. Um, highly recommended. I argue that's the beginning of neoconservatism right there, including all their foreign policy, but especially their policy in Israel. Um, anyway, so they got their asses kicked in a newly integrated neighborhood in Brooklyn in the 1940s. I got mine kicked in a newly integrated, well, no, in a long, I was born into an integrated neighborhood, but still in California in the 1970s and 80s, got my asses kicked there. And I, so they went rightward and, and learned to hate the Negro. And in fact, that's what he says, but or it's in that very essay. He says he hates them with, I think at some one point he says, I hate them with all of my heart or all of my soul or something. I mean, it's a very <laughs> strong statement, which I really admire, by the way. Um, that was, you know, early in liberalism, early 60s, but still it was a pretty radical thing to say. I mean, you, of course, couldn't say that anywhere in polite society now. But my God, I defend people's right to hate. And let's why can't we? I mean, why? We should be able to hate. I don't care who you hate. Um, anyway, he says straight up. So, but I didn't. A lot of, you know, a lot of kids who grew up in Berkeley in similar circumstances chose to be Negrophiles, basically, you know, wiggers, et cetera, and love rap music and all and reggae and all of it. Um, mm -hmm. And also became very left wing and especially on, on race issues. And I was very left wing. I mean, I guess I still am, but I, I, I see it very differently, the issue. But, I, you know, I, um, I guess I'm not. A, no, I'm not left wing anymore on the issue. <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> but anyway, we don't have to go down that road. Um, but yes, I do think I do think those original experiences in childhood can lead you down an interesting political path. But that's what I share with neoconservatives. Of course, also our Trotskyist heritage. You know, they were in the, as I've said before, they were in the same organizations that my parents were, mm -hmm. the socialists. So it's very weird. Yeah. My relationship to the neocons. I've never known one personally. Um, I would love, love, love the one I want to speak to. Maybe the only one I think who would be interesting is, is Kagan, Robert Kagan, who's mm -hmm. Victoria Newland's husband, who's a historian. And he's written, I think, brilliant, excellent and correct histories of US foreign policy. Yeah. He argues in it's called the dangerous nation. Absolutely essential reading. No one will give it the time of day because it's written by a neocon. He argues, but he doesn't argue he fucking proves because there's so much evidence for this, that the founding fathers to a man were imperialists and wanted a global American empire from the get go. They always had that in mind. They wanted a new Rome. They were interventionists to the hilt. They wanted to remake the whole world in the American image straight up. No different than George Bush and the neocons today. It's true. The neocons are simply the truest to that heritage is what that book is essentially arguing. And yeah, they're right. This has been an aggressive evangelical imperialist nation since the beginning, since before the beginning. And the, so the neocons are, sent, are really the ones who are sort of holding the flame of American exceptionalist imperialism, right? See, Dan Bessner and a lot of people, someone else is saying this, um, they kind of, Biden and Blinken and Sullivan and all these people who run foreign policy, they're not, it's kind of hard to see that they're really true believers about that stuff. They used to be. American foreign policy leaders totally did want to remake the world in, in America's image, really were. I mean like old fashioned imperialists and their conceptions of that, but the new crop, I mean, meaning like since Trump, like right now, these people, I'm not sure. Um, it's weird. Like, what is this about? Why are we doing all this for you guys? See, I got it before, you know, LBJ was like, we're going to remake Vietnam into a new, new deal. We're going to make it into a new deal America. Like, and he was going to develop the entire Mekong Delta and bring in factories and, socialized medicine and all the rest of it, you know. Um, but now I'm not like, does Biden really think that way? Does he want to like 
you know, a Marshall plan to remake Western Europe like America and basically make it totally subservient to America. That kind of, that's what we've done. Like with the idea that the more other people are like America, the better they'll be. That's why, I, that's the whole rationale for Iraq. Like, you know, and once they like had the thumbs showing they voted, we were like, yay, our children. Mm -hmm. It's it's all just a fundamentally paternalistic, imperialistic um, psychology, really. But I'm not sure that Biden and company have that. You know, Samantha Power does. Who else? I mean, Tony Blinken might somewhere. That guy's traumatized. I almost feel bad. You know, do you know what's happening to him at his house every single day? No. Oh, well, yeah, I know some people who are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are people I normally really dislike. But in this case, I'm like, yeah, let him have it. Um, Palestine solidarity people are camped out, have been camped out night and day, 24 seven since the war starts six months now of mm -hmm. his house in front of his house. And I guess for whatever reason, it's kind of surprising DC or Virginia, whatever law doesn't make the, it's actually legal what they're doing. They're in camp. There's an encampment in front of his house. And on top of this, every time a, his car goes in or out of his house, they throw buckets of red paint onto his car um the blood of gazan children they say and but they every his wife his kids they're in the car they're getting doused with red paint every time they go in or out of that house um i mean if we weren't killing last estimate was 105 children a day i would be opposed to such things but you know come on um go for it <laughs> anyway, yeah, I but I don't know, like Tony Blinken, he's so traumatized right now. It's hard to tell what he really believes. He really does look stricken. Um, it's kind of wild. Never seen a secretary of state that sort of insecure and scared looking. Jake Sullivan, he's an apparatchik. He works for Hillary Clinton. What it does did the see the Clintons are the ones who broke the back of that. Like Clintons were certainly interventionist, absolutely want to roll back Russia, but it's like, does she really want to remake? The world in Russia in America's image? That's unclear to me. Um, so it's sort of strange. We're in a moment where the empire is on autopilot or zombie pilot, seemingly. You know, I want to talk to these people and say, yo, Joe, do you like, are you into that whole thing that Woodrow Wilson talked about? You know, like Christianizing the world and our image and all that, mm -hmm. like going into the Philippines and teaching the children how to speak English and have good manners. Like, are you into that? Like, what is it? Or you want to like make sure we have democracy everywhere? You know, at the point of a gun, we're going to fort is I, I don't know. I don't think so. Like, are they Christians in that way? It, it, I think it's hubris and sunken cost fallacies. Oh, right. Think, yeah. Oh, God. Never thought about that. That yeah. that explains a lot. Actually, that I mean, that could explain a lot for why. Why such an aggressive thing with Russia? Why such an why hang on to Israel like this? Because there's in the in the day back in the day before we before we discovered uh fracking i get it i get it the oil was there you had to make sure the suez canal was always open so you had to make sure that israel to the north and egypt to the south of the suez canal were under your control i get it supporting israel i mean from the american strategic point of view totally until about what what was it fracking 2000s um, but now, like, it's absolutely, z there's zero benefit. I mean, it does, yes, the oil does, much of it goes to Western Europe. So you do need to keep that open. However, I think pipelines now account for more and more of oil shipments. So I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, think about this. So they blew up the Nord Stream pipeline supplying, which I think was the biggest supplier of oil to Northern Europe. And now... Um, I've been listening to Iranian um, intellectuals, like you know, talk about what's going on there, about what the what the government's planning, and they don't know, but they're saying, "Listen," <laughs> and I'd never heard it, never thought of it, thought of it this way. But um, look at a map. Um, look where all the oil is. Look where look where the United States bases are, military bases are protecting that oil and protecting the kingdoms that oversee that oil, meaning the Gulf states, right? Look at a map. They are directly across the goddamn Gulf from Iran, who have missiles, we know this, that can go way farther than that. There's no problem. And, you know, and then that would just send 
I mean, the economic effects of that, if they bombed, and they don't even have to like obliterate the place, just bomb the oil fields. What that would do to the world economy, I mean, I think that would bring nuclear war because it would be it would be almost as destructive as launching a nuclear weapon. Um, but that's what they're thinking. I mean, they so Israel and the United, especially the United States, are very aware of that. That that's that's what Iran has in its as its trump card. They have underground bases. There's been amazing journalism about this. Um, Alistair Crook has written about this. I think I said this before weeks ago. But yeah, there's dozens and dozens, I think, of underground, fully autonomous military bases in Iran, the Iranian military, um, each with basically autonomous control, command and control. Um, I mean, I don't know exactly how autonomous, but that's how it's described. They do not, as I understand it, any of them have, this could be wrong, any nuclear devices. Of course, no, they never got to nuclear devices, but whatever. Um, but they have, apparently it's, it's dozens of them all around the country underground, again, safe from US and Israeli bombs that could wipe out certainly all the Gulf states and probably Tel Aviv. Um, so yeah, this is, <laughs> we got a lot going on here. I still have to make the renegade case for OJ Simpson. Back to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was trying to figure out a, a segue between OJ and the mullahs of Iran. It's hard. Uh, so, okay. Cause he, cause he, cause he broke the law and got away with it. That's that's one interpretation, yeah, that he's the modern Stagger Lee. Uh, yeah. Stagger Lee and Dolomite and company, the black black folk heroes. I'm trying to think. I mean, there was a, mm, most of the killing that they did or do that I recall is of black men. Yeah, Their rivals, gambling basically. and pimps there's and some all that. like there's some like defeating of white men sort of in like in contests, but not killing them so much. And there's not. And fortunately, I mean, I don't rem I don't know of any blues music, blues songs that talk about raping white women. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, um, and these were songs in the 20s and 30s. NWA's that were second or third good. album. Who? NWA second or third album. They act a uh, rape out on a, of a white woman. Yeah, they do in a sketch. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. How do I not know that? Really? Yeah. How did it, how did that not get discussed when the movie came out? That's crazy. <laughs> uh, I mean, the movie is not about. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, the movie didn't really touch their later albums. It was just. I'm no. I'm shocked. There was some, yeah. you know, feminist pushback against them when the movie came out, but they didn't mention that. I don't think mm -hmm. that's crazy. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I know. It's just like it's not a renegade behavior. It is renegade behavior. It's but it's not one I endorse. Mm -hmm. or want in my in my world uh uh so <laughs> alec mohibian the filthy armenian yeah uh la his son. take on this was uh rest in peace oj simpson you solved race in america from 1994 to 2008 uh yeah. basically saying that there was a period of racial harmony after the oj trial uh where racial tensions were played out uh in this simile of a cable drama and everybody uh got their frustrations out in a positive simulacrum also uh seeing somebody seeing a black man essentially kill a white woman that he had had sex with before and get away with it eased racial tensions right. uh, <laughs> and it made black people believe that the system wasn't rigged against them that they could participate in society that things weren't rigged yeah. against them that yeah that uh yeah and uh as you mentioned the discourse and cleaning up uh the lapd and mark For Furman and all that uh came from it uh damn dude yeah also the birth of reality tv uh, <laughs> most importantly no that yeah. was the writer that was the writer strike that caused mm -hmm. that it was uh-huh the right there was a writer strike that because i was doing reality tv at the time it <laughs> this was in i mean and it, it didn't start then but it absolutely took off was whenever that was it was like 20 it was right after my book came out 20 10 11 12 there was a writer strike in hollywood a big one and so they couldn't write any fiction any any um script 
So there's no scripted shows anymore. And that's so reality shows came out because that was all non-union. When was uh, this? No What's that? When was this? Well, I know it was around the time that I was shopping my book for TV shows, um, which was a big thing. For 2010, 11, 12, right in there? Oh. 11, 10, 10, 11. 10, uh -huh. 11, yeah. Well, I'm talking about the relationship between uh, the courtroom drama of the case was one thing. So you get the rise of, yeah, courtroom cases and TV. But also uh, the, yeah. the Kardashians are not famous, if not for O.J. Simpson. No, I would call it like the prehistory of reality TV for sure. Mm -hmm. No, it's definitely a part of the story of reality yeah. TV. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Um, it, it might you might even call it like the the origin of it. In fact, yeah, it might, I guess it was the first trial that was fully televised. Is that right? Um, like that? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think it was right. It was awesome entertainment. Oh, my God, mm -hmm. I was riveted. That was incredibly. I mean. I would just sit there like on the edge of I would put a chair in front of the TV and just like lean forward and just like stare at the TV the whole time. It was so fascinating. Remember, remember, people, this was before the Internet. Don't laugh at me. Um, I'm very old. It was awesome. But yeah, when they when they announced the acquittal, I took a chair and I threw it all the way across the room. I was so outraged because mm -hmm. I was a very earnest young man. Then, you know, don't blame me. Um, as I said, I've learned I've learned the ways of the of the master race since then um that's behavior you should reserve for sporting events i i agree yeah. yeah god what a bummer of a final four the whole fucking the whole tournament just was like lame anyway um yeah okay yes much was accomplished from what he did as a result i should say as a result of what he did as a consequence mm -hmm. as a consequence of what he did sure i mean same as hamas right i mean think about I mean, what just on their terms, what a resounding and ongoing victory. It's just like one W after another. After I mean, Israel is just like taking shot after shot after shot from other people now, um, just completely losing every conceivable way. And I can't imagine. I mean, from there again, from their perspective, I can't imagine a more victorious outcome. Now, the question is. All I hear from my buddies who are the big pro-Israel types um, say is, well, they don't they love killing their own people. And that's actually good. And they really like killing their own people, which is what this is about. And now I do know there's a culture of martyrdom for sure. Um, I wonder how deep it is, how intense it is. Do people really are people really happy when their child is killed in Gaza? I have not seen evidence of that. <laughs> I've seen evidence of it like years later when they have a poster of them calling them a martyr, but are like. That's what they're kind of implying is like the people, ordinary people in Gaza, like and even Hamas leaders, like they're happy when their child is killed. I don't know. But um, anyway, what Hamas did was tremendous on October 7th. I mean, yes. 600, I guess, civilians, um, I guess that's the official number now. 700 civilians were killed. And so like that's seven, that's 700 war crimes to me and 700 uh unspeakable atrocities and um no they didn't do mass rape and no they didn't behead babies but they they fucking killed if not 700 i saw videos of them killing for sure at least you know a dozen which is enough for me like that's but yeah but nonetheless the the reaction that that brought um I mean, has been the, the biggest catastrophe in Israeli history. That country is hanging by a thread, not right now, but like it is setting up to be in and, and the hubris out of them. Israelis is real. I just look, I step back and watch, watch them. Like, do you guys know what, what are you, what's going on here? Like, I mean, people hate them now. I mean, I'm talking about People who work in the State Department are leaving, are resigning. There's this woman who's just resigned last week and issued this whole denunciation of Israel. And I mean, and she said she speaks for a lot of people. I mean, we're talking about the State Department. Uh, we're talking about establishment people. We're talking now of senators. There's several, many senators, many, many Congress people who are um, appalled. Even who who said, who just said that it was out? Oh, uh. Kurt, not Kirby, duh, Jesus, 
was it Biden? One of the one of the White House flax, one of the White House spokespeople said it's outrageous what Israel's doing. Might have been Biden himself. Did he use the word outrageous? I think he did. Um, today or yesterday, one of the one somebody from the White House said it's outrageous what they used that word. Um, a million people in the streets in every city in the world. I don't. I like, and I haven't even talked about the Arabs the Arabs who live in the Middle East and what they want to do to you. <laughs> I mean, you're completely encircled by people who were homicidal before, but they've now just, I mean, the jihadis who want to just take out Israel now can't even imagine how many young men are signing up to do just that right now and how many want to do it and how many will cheer when it happens. I mean, and the EU, the European, I mean, they got Germany. And they got sort of half of the UK. The rest of the EU has abandoned them. People don't realize this. Like, I don't, I don't know if Israelis are being told what's going on. Like, this is um, extreme isolation. Yeah. Wow. Right. Of course. I'm sure. Yeah. On that note, yeah. Uh, Google and Amazon staffers are quitting because of uh, the contracts with Israel and uh, uh, the Project Nimbus thing with the Israel Ministry of Defense. Uh, just a project to get AI technology to Israel. Uh, there's been a massive uh, round of resignations at high levels with Google and Amazon over this. Yeah. Yeah. All Every every establishment institution that we normally hate, that n normally lick the boots of empire, that normally do whatever the FBI tell them to do, that normally take orders from the Democratic National Committee, those people who work in those places hate Israel now. They hate Israel. They see Israel as a giant baby killer, which right now it is on one level. That is what it is. I mean, this just the facts. We have 13,000 dead babies, children to show for that. Um, so in the next congressional election, how many candidates will run at least in part on their position against funding Israel. This is now a political chip in your favor. It's this because it's a damn near consensus. Eight, the latest poll on this, you know how many percentage of Americans who approve of Israel's handling of the war in Gaza is 18%. 18% hmm. of Americans appro approve of that war, um, of Israel in that war. No, it'll be like a chip in your favor in the next election to be opposed to funding Israel. So I mean this, I am actually concerned about people I know in Israel, people who are good people, really good people. Um, I'm not saying in the next, I'm not saying like it's immediate, but five to 10 years, I, I just, unless some crazy reversal happens or Hamas commits, you know, mass suicide, I don't see it, but it's even then, because it's not Hamas. Hamas is such a sideshow at this point. It's the masses and masses and masses of people around the world who hate your guts and want to defund you today. Not only that, and get our money back too. Four billion a year for how many years, right? I want that back. I want my Israel refund. Um, it's just such a bizarre idea. Let's have a colony of Jews in the middle of the Middle East. That'll be great. And exclude and kick out all the Arabs so that we can have the best beachfront property. Don't, mm -hmm. don't. I was going to say, I mean, the amazing thing is the Zionists at the time, they all said this. They said that they're going to fight us. This, they said, this is a colony and the natives are going to fight us. And so we're going to have to fight them. And they said, basically forever. It was called the Iron Wall philosophy. I mean, they knew, they said this at the beginning. I'm like, wait, why are we even debating anything? This they they announced this shit was going to happen, and we were like, okay, go ahead, have a a Jewish ethno apartheid ethno state in the Middle East. <laughs> I mean, wow. Christopher yeah. Hitchens called it. Christopher Hitchens. Everybody should go find the Christopher Hitchens. Go on YouTube and just and search Hitchens and Israel or Zionism. I think. And he, there's a there's an awesome supercut of him. It's like six or seven talks he gave in which 
it's like a 10 minutes thing, 10 minute video of it's pieces of him talking about Zionism and the whole idea of Israel. It's devastating. And I wish that certain people I know who are fans of Hitchens uh, and are also fans of Israel would watch this because this is when he, and this is when Hitchens was hating Muslims more than anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to show this stand up clip. Uh, Geo, uh, giant Geo, Geo Panichetti shared it. My man, love him. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was talking about just, I mean, just using this as an example of kitsch, most likely, but I think this does encapsulate where sentiment is on the left. And this is like clapter, like the stuff that we would be opposed to about five years ago. But right when it, the point that's being made here is is something that might work in our favor, potentially. A lot of people uh. want Democrats to lose, understandably. A lot of people want the Democrats to be punished and to suffer a historic and humiliating defeat. And white liberals are very tense. Right? They're like, is that what you really want? Is that what you really want? You want Trump to come back? You want Trump to win? What I want is for you to not lecture us on how to respond to a genocide you didn't try to stop. Okay? You think that's a good idea? You think that's a good idea for your community? Because it's your community that's going to suffer if Trump comes back. People like you are going to suffer. What do you think of that? I think that a political system that ultimately makes you choose between genocidal dementia, Cheeseburger <laughs> powered fake tan Hitler, <laughs> overthrowing okay maybe that is the conclusion you should be coming to instead of lecturing black and brown people on why they don't worship the democrats okay word hell yeah who's that guy amar Rahman. did you know him before uh, i did not no i'm not hmm. that's great so what's yeah. geo's point uh he said, wait, this is a comedy show, quotation marks, uh, that this is you're just being lectured to and that the punchline is uh, genocidal dementia in cheeseburger Hitler, which is basically like a right wing parody of a left wing comedian calling just going directly into hysterics, like trying to make you feel bad and lecturing you about things and then having a this childish response calling somebody cheeseburger hitler or as the right wing does oh. cheeto hitler oh so he wasn't feeling it the way i was no I he wasn't no. Oh. yeah <laughs> i totally misread that that's hilarious yeah. uh geo geo i love you but you're wrong um mm -hmm. so he goes about it in the wrong way yes i agree he yes he calls trump names that are basically from tds these are tds names trump derangement syndrome names yes Mm -hmm. Um, genocidal. I don't actually even criticize now the use of the term genocide. I think it's a mistake to go that route with this. But anyway, so mm -hmm. um, yeah, he sounds like an MSNBC liberal in the way he's delivering his point. Yeah, but but the point, guys, come on. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? You're mad about that? He's this is a fucking MSNBC liberal who's saying overthrow the whole thing. Fuck both parties. Mm -hmm. Hello. Why is this not good? <laughs> this is good. This is what we want. This is this is a very positive outcome of the Gaza war politically for us internally. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that a lot of people are leaving the Democrats. And these are people who are not. And the best thing about them to me is they're not automatically joining the Republicans. Like the whole intellectual dark web Dave Rubin movement was about. Right. That was about. I'm mad about liberals now and I don't like woke and the Democrats are no longer my party and I'm going to join the Republicans now and become a conservative and say everything the conservatives say. It's not that. These people have a different politics and you know what it is? It's basically Bernie Sanders politics. So this is the final, this is the long awaited sort of latent split in the Democratic Party that I was hoping was going to happen 10 years ago with Bernie. I was mm -hmm. hoping that Bernie was going to lead his whole faction out of the fucking Democratic Party and start a new party which I would never join, probably would never vote for, but it would be really good for American politics because we just need more competition. Um, and also, I think on some issues, especially foreign policy, not Bernie so much, but his followers, a whole lot better than the establishment. I mean, that's where like a lot of the big anti-Zionists now in America, they were all Bernie Sanders people. Mm -hmm. Now they're not, but you know. Yeah. The only two so, people I've ever seen bring up 
uh, the Shah of Iran being, uh, you know, the coup that took place in 1959 and the Shah being reinstated in Iran and that being the cause of all the trouble. 53, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the only two people I've ever seen bring that up are Ron Paul and Bernie Sanders on national debate stages. Yeah, the, the coup against Mossadegh in 53, um, which was orchestrated by Theodore Roosevelt's grandson, Kermit Washington, uh, Kermit, Kermit Roosevelt. Um, Kermit Washington was a sax player, <laughs> right? Wait, Kermit. Yeah, he's Kermit's? a sax player. I think he's a sax player. Anyway, um, I mean, yeah, those guys, that's OG stuff. Of course, Ron Paul would say that because that is the that's the beginning of everything in the Middle East with the US and really with all of it. Like there were no jihadis. There was no terrorism against Americans or any really anything. There were no American wars. There were no drones. There was none of that. None of that stuff um, until we started overthrowing governments that were elected <laughs> in the middle of the, to, to basically keep control of the oil. Yeah, I mean, 53 is the origin of everything. You can trace everything in the Middle East back to that moment. And then, yeah, look at the new Zionist, the new Israeli state that's starting at the same time, asserting its uh, interest in saying essentially offering itself as a colonial outpost in the Middle East. Oh, hey, guys, you're having trouble over here. We hate these Arabs. We will help you fight them if you give us your fighter jets and lots of bombs and artillery to lob into places like Gaza, uh, which they did. Finally, the French did. Well, the British, then the French, and then finally the US did in 60, beginning, beginning in 67. Um, uh, Kermit Washington was a power forward for the LA Lakers. Damn, who am I in thinking of? Yeah. Oh, right, he was. That's right, he sure yeah. was. He was scary too. Yeah, he, yeah. he was famous he for was, being in the fights. Yeah, he was a thug back when there were there. There aren't any thugs anymore because all these kids in the NBA are now like basketball academy kids. You know, they go mm -hmm. to private schools. Um, they're not. No one's from the hood anymore. It's kind of weird. It's a very yeah. strange thing. They're really good, so they're technically amazing, but there's no flavor. There's no flavor. There's no character. There's nothing. None of that. They're all just like suburban, middle class, private school, basketball geeks. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what's next, man? Uh, you. When we were talking about OJ, you did bring up Michael Tracy. I just want to bring up Michael Tracy's point on OJ that. Uh, He's the ever the contrarian and believes that uh, the jury got it right and that the jury saw way more evidence than we ever could and that it's best to assume they that did. OJ was innocent. Uh, also, I, I do believe that there's a very strong chance that OJ could have been innocent. Uh, his his kids stuck by him throughout all of his life. Uh, oh. Yeah, I think um, he does behave as if he's a pathological liar in a lot of ways. But, uh, you know, if you're the subject of this giant media campaign and it's potential that you act out in weird ways like that, if, if you're perceived in that way. Uh, and I think it's it's good to honor True. him in some way. Uh, and it's yeah, I think the leading theory that it wasn't him was that it was some drug dealers or something that were actually trying to kill him because he didn't pay them for coke or something. We've never seen any I've never seen any evidence of any drugs around or any drug issues around any of the three people involved. Mm -hmm. Have you? I've never heard of uh, like any of the three. I don't think issues, but I think they partied. Oh, well, right. This was in the early 90s in L.A. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, in Brentwood, um, which is like one of the wealthier parts of West L.A. Um, yeah. No, there was everybody did coke man mm -hmm. uh so uh oh some people are saying his son did it oh yeah that's that's another theory is that his son did it and he was covering for his son but oh. th this is a deep rabbit hole yeah that's uh, okay i would i would pursue that that's interesting mm -hmm. um, uh yeah. chat saying that they think you're thinking of the trumpet player kermit ruffin that you're thinking of no, there was a set. I think it was alto sax in like the nineties, two thousands. With it was like K Washington. Okay. Oh, Damn. Kamasi Washington. Not, was it Kamasi? That's, no, it wasn't Kamasi. No, no. That's he's popular now, but yeah. Oh, 
Is that who I'm thinking of? Probably. I don't know. Kamasi oh, yeah. is famous now. That's who I'm thinking of. Yeah. Sax? Sax, yeah. Yeah, it's him. There. Yeah. Why did you fucking string me along like this? You were just teasing Cause me? Because he's modern, and I didn't think you'd know a modern guy. <laughs> you mean like contemporary? Yeah, contemporary. Yeah. You mean like today? Yes. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> like, no. He really no he's been around right? for decades. He's been around for decades. <laughs> he has. Uh, Kamasi Washington, hasn't he? Yeah, but I mean, he comes out of the LA scene, and he's new. He's not that old. Uh, He's, well, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really hip, young man. Don't you know? I bet he's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Next. Yeah. Uh, and News. then one more thing on OJ. Mark oh. Lamont Hill talking about OJ. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he called him. Shoot, I don't have it anymore. But he said, uh, "Pathological liar mm. and a traitor mm. to his community." Right. Yeah. Man, I'm sorry. Mark's been good lately. He's great on Palestine and he's really good on OJ, I think. But he's also super smart. It's like, I just think he has the right take and it's kind of a brave take that no one else is making. Yeah, he, he's totally denouncing OJ. Don't lionize him. Don't make him a hero. He's a, he sucks. But like, but the court did the right thing. You know, the what the jury did, they made the right decision for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. Well, from a legal perspective, if you think evidence has been tampered, you kind of have to go a certain way. Like, hey, you're and anytime, anytime you know that there's racist motivation among the cops, and I don't care which direction the racism is going in, mm -hmm. if as a judge, you're going to throw the whole thing out. Like, you need to. If there's mm -hmm. that kind of prejudice, it doesn't matter if it's racism, any kind of prejudice like that that's in the in the cops you it's done for me i mean if the mm -hmm. state is demo is we know that the state has that kind of prejudice in it against the defendant you have to throw that out uh-huh well Which, i think right yeah well i'm not sure about prejudice uh i mean maybe if it's a state actor that escalates things but i think he was, he was evidence, prejudiced uh, uh what's his face is was mark uh Furman. Furman was prejudiced yeah but uh, I don't think attitudes necessarily and prejudice is enough to throw a case out. I think uh, if you see evidence that evidence has been tampered with, that's enough to throw a case out. If that if you see that you're being presented false evidence, then that's the line that's to be crossed. But uh, um, it, dude, if you were accused, if you were on trial for murder and it turned out the lead investigator was talking about honkies and white boys and how he hated white boys and mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> you have like a legitimate beef against the system at that point. If they allowed this guy to be, yeah. continue to present evidence uh -huh. against you, All come right. on now, come on now. And wouldn't the whole case be suspect because he is the lead investigator? Uh, a, guy who hates, a guy who hates white people. He's, he has said, I hate white people on multiple podcasts. He has said, I hate white people. Mm -hmm. And, and then you're accused falsely of murder. You're on trial. He's the lead investigator the prosecution is using to put you away for life or put you on death row. You would be like, okay, well, this is le this is fair. <laughs> he doesn't really mean it. <laughs> like, yeah, come on. I mean, you're talking about personal attitudes. Um, I mean, I think there's more to be made in defense. The point I wanted to get to earlier, though, was uh, the first point Mark Lamont Hill made about OJ being a traitor to his community. Oh, and yeah. uh, the famous yeah. quote, I'm not black, I'm OJ. All uh, right. Right, yeah. right. Uh, so to me, that's all contextual. Like, what did he, mm -hmm. what was happening right then? Who was being, who was asking him? What was, what was in his mind at that moment? Mm -hmm. What was going on in the world at that moment? Those are really important. I want to hear the context before I can judge this, but. You know, um, if you believe that race is a social construct mm -hmm. that has been fundamentally nefarious always in its history, um, that it has n served nothing but malign purposes, ideas about race, all of it, it's just all, none of it's good. I mean, except for jokes, you know. Um, then you should applaud O.J. Simpson or anybody for renouncing their 
sort of uh, alleged ties to some race because the society insists that you belong to this thing, this group of people, this this thing that's a social construct that was invented to enslave people in his case. Uh, I mean, don't we want to be for that? Now, if it was him like coming out in favor of segregation, you know, and saying we should we should vote for George Wallace in 1968. OK, you know, when there was actual segregation, basically, or the remnants of it and actual racists trying to push actual racist segregationist laws that would truly restrict anybody who looks like you. Yeah, but in whenever he said that the 1970s or 80s. No, he's he's saying, listen, that was the black the black community, that's all that was forced upon us by slave masters and people like George Wallace. And I took him to mean that I uh, know I, be, I have become so successful and such an and such an individual set six um, successfully, which he did, like he did sort of transcend race. People didn't think of him as the black guy on TV. They thought of him as OJ. He mm -hmm. was OJ running through the airports and being in movies and all that. So I don't know. I think it was a good thing for him to say that. So mm -hmm. I disagree with Mark Lamont Hill on that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Right. Don't uh, you? Yeah. I, that's, I that's, think race, that's I mean, that's race essentialism. That's shit. That's fucked up. Uh -huh. we don't and like that. Uh, the, he has a the implication is that he has a duty to his race. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like the worst form of race essentialism, like mm -hmm. because of how you were born, you have some duty to other people. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. What? I <laughs> didn't sign up for that. Yeah. I mean, what if what if it was some duty to white people that what I was supposed to have, right? We would mm -hmm. think, don't don't do that. that that's ridiculous. <laughs> Fuck those uh, guys. What did they ever do for you? Yeah, good question, Mark Lamont Hill. Uh -huh. And uh Mark Lamont Hill, much like that comedian, uh, whose name I've already forgotten, is somebody who something Arab. Yeah. Somebody we've essentially disagreed with up until October 7th of last year on everything. Uh, pretty much. Well, no, I I didn't really. I, so I was actually on his show like, God, 2012, HuffPost Live, 2013, yeah. way back then. On the couch? No, I... What was that? Were you on the couch? On the couch. No, that was... I zoomed in. He was on the couch. Oh, okay. But... Um, no, I think... I've always thought he was a good guy. Always. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought he was actually a pretty good principled intellectual i do um in general not always but generally i do think he give, he's really interested in like hearing the other side and like really addressing the counter arguments he's a very rigor i'd say he's rigorous he's very rigorous mm -hmm. intellectual very serious he's written serious scholarly books i mean the dude like learned arabic just so he could study palestine more rigorously and that's not even his main topic you know he does u.s politics mostly and like cultural race politics. I mean, he, but he did this whole like Palestine, Israel, deep study, became an expert on it, fluent in Arabic. So, <clears throat> but he's got, <clears throat> no, I mean, I disagree with him vehemently on most things for sure, but I want to go back and look at the Mark Lamont Hill re record and see <laughs> if there's more there actually. Cause I did, I, I remember like often like noticing that, Oh, I, I see something of value in him. He's not just your typical liberal mouthpiece mm -hmm. there is something good going on there so yeah but i think the center of both the comedian and mark lamont hill's arguments are <laughs> a sense of responsibility to their oh. race and they make that very explicit oh. right yeah which is why probably. they're interested in palestine that way you know oh thank you for thank you um all right i would like everybody who is on the Palestinian side in this to go read an article in Haaretz that came out, I think, just a few days ago, maybe last week, by Amira Haas. So I almost don't have to say anything more than that. Um, she is an Israeli, born in Israel. Both parents, I believe, and multiple relatives were actual, truly Holocaust survivors. There's a lot of bullshitting, by the way, about Holocaust survivors in people's families. You pulled it up? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, here it is. So this is what I've been waiting for. 
Um, this is the challenge to the Palestine Solidarity Network. It doesn't mean we were wrong, but this needs to be taken seriously and we need to incorporate this into what we say. Um, if it's at all true. Now, so she lived, she's an Israeli Jew, multiple relatives were in the camps, multiple relatives were killed in the camps. So this isn't legit. And then this woman, and I think she did it by herself too, but she lived in Gaza for many years and then wrote a book about it, a memoir. And she has been a columnist for Haaretz for, I think, decades from a very left-wing perspective. She is very, very, I don't know what you would call it, but, you know, in solidarity with the Palestinians and very super critical of the Israeli policies. But so she comes out with this article. So she knows Gaza. She lived there. Um, and she's arguing with quite a bit of evidence here that... Um, there are a lot of people in Gaza who are opposed to Hamas and it might be a big majority. Now that's what we need to find out about because the, the maybe the big, the most horrifying thought I've had about Gaza, aside from the blown apart children's bodies, um, is the idea of people who were born there, who were just never political in any way, never wanted to be political, weren't interested in any of that, just didn't want to be a part of it on in any way or another, right? Just didn't want to be, didn't want to resist, didn't want to comply, didn't just didn't wanted to paint pictures. Like there's actually a girl or young woman in Killing Gaza, the Max Blumenthal documentary, Dan Cohen documentary. That to me, that was the most poignant thing. They interview her. She's clearly that kind of person. She just she's an artist and she just wants to make pictures and does not care about politics. But she's trapped. She has she's forced by the whole structural situation, you know, but by all the actors, by Israel, Hamas and everyone around many people around her. You have to be political. You're forced to be political in that situation. And that's what I want to free people from more than anything. I want people to be free from political obligations of all kinds. And so this article and the fact that I'm so glad it came from her. Um, and it listen, it's been hard to say anything at all critical at all about the whole movement since October 7th, because it's been so urgent. Because again, like kids are dying all the time. I mean, I just don't know if we don't care about this. What do we care about? But but no, um, now it's time, I think, to start thinking. We Everyone is starting to think more about long term. What does this mean? And the United States is is just as involved as Israel is, really. I mean, and Americans are, you know, our names are on it. Our money is in it. It's it's our baby. We made that. <laughs> that's, our, that's our decisions right there. That's what Gaza is. I mean, it wouldn't have happened if not for U.S. policies. Um, but we got to think about what actually people who live there really, really think. And it's been a little hard to discern that. And even in, even in documentaries like Killing Gaza, I'm like, I'm always thinking, are these people really speaking freely? Like how freely are they speaking? I think generally they sort of are, but you know, I don't know. Um, I'd like to know just how deep the anti-Hamas sentiment is. How much do people blame Hamas for this? How much do they want to overthrow Hamas? And I don't even, I mean, it's up to them to tell me, you know, and then I'll make my political calculations based on that. But that's just, a, it's a data point that I don't have. And so this is, this is, it's not exhaustive by any means, but it is highly suggestive that there is a large percentage of Palestinians in Gaza who are firmly anti Hamas. So mm -hmm. we, uh, we need to acknowledge well, that. And I, I want to see how the left deals with that. I mean, I assume they're going to ignore it. I hope the gray zone addresses it. I really do. This is the first time I've seen sort of something that I wish that our side would address that I don't think it will. Um, but Well, we I, I've heard the point constantly made that, uh, what was it, when there was an election, the supposed election that Palestinians 
gave consent for Hamas to rule them and that implicates all of Palestinians. It's It was only 30% that voted for Hamas. And it was 15 years ago, I think. Yeah. I mean, or more. I mean, what? No. Mm-hmm. That's the most ridiculous. I mean, most people know that. That's ridiculous. Uh-huh. You know, and half then, half half the people who live in Gaza weren't born during the last yeah. election. So come on. Oh yeah, it was it was pretty much it was eighteen years ago, right? It, and yeah. they did not win a majority. Yeah. It was only a plurality. I think it was forty percent. Not even was it twenty percent or forty? It was a I think plurality. It was 30. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So almost two decades ago, less than less than half of the people in Gaza voted for those fuckers. Mm-hmm. And. Most of those people aren't even alive. Like and most then, of the right. people alive in Gaza weren't even around to vote for that. Yeah, I mean, then again, I mean, and again, I, I need. I've never been there, and it's really hard to tell this, but to fig- find this out. But you know, when the Allies bombed the German cities, Dresden, Hamburg, etc., the argument that was made in the allied high command was that this will cause the German civilians to turn against Hitler and overthrow the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. And it just did just the opposite, of course, right? It caused people to out of desperation to rally around the regime for protection because that was the only people with guns who could shoot back at, you know, the U S and RAF bombers destroying everything. Um, so, I mean, the bombardment that Gaza has under um, undertaken, has experienced in the last two decades, and because this is just the latest, people don't realize, it's just the biggest and the latest, but my God. Th- I mean, the whole world was absolutely horrified in a similar way. What was it? Cast lead, 2014. That was the biggest one. 2,300 were killed. Mm-hmm. Same thing, just smaller scale, but it was 2,300 mostly civilians killed, a lot of children but that's you know over and over again it's like one every two years i think they israel bombards gaza and then there's killings in between too lots of killings especially on the west bank and in every case right just imagine being born there being raised there living there and that happens on a regular basis i mean you're gonna want to kill some at least israelis and i wouldn't blame you if you want to kill jews because the israelis are telling you this is what jews do I that's think, what uh, israelis that's yeah. I just want to say that like that's what Israelis that's what the state of Israel is saying this is what Jews do we are the Jew we represent Jewish people including people like Thad Russell who's one quarter Jewish they do like one Jewish grandparent gets you entrance as a citizen to Israel so they speak for me they're speaking for me and they're saying this is we represent Israel if you speak against us you're anti-semitic we are the same as Jewish we are as, as Judaism we're the, there's the synonymous And so how do you blame people in Gaza for like saying, okay, then we hate Jews because y'all kill us. Like, I mean, so, yeah, Uh, I think uh, (laughs) the justification for bombing Dresden that you discussed was purely propagandistic and something that was only sold to American civilians. I think the military strategy was actually pretty cynical and they wanted to just devastate uh the infrastructure of germany i think that's probably what i i mean i think they just want to raise it so they can take it over um but so i actually okay now i'm remembering i actually looked at the very the very document well this was the original this was the raf this was the british Mm -hmm. directive at the beginning of the of the air war against germany it was it's an incredible document you can find it online actually um I think it's 1940. It, it lays out like that the RAF will go after particular targets, not necessarily civilian targets, but um, industrial targets for sure. And that would lead to mass starvation, mm-hmm. which would then, I think they do say then, it would then cause much of the civilian population to rise up against the regime. Although you're kind of, you're mostly right in that most of it was about simply crippling the ability of the German government, the Nazi regime to wage war, you know, to sort of just destroy it, sort of the infrastructure of it. But there was, there were, there were, there was talk about like how this would have a, an effect on the civilians that would, 
that would destabilize the government regime change talk, but it was secondary. It's true. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and then, um, do you think the Gaza uh, civilian population is hip to uh, Hamas itself being central to Netanyahu's divide and conquer strategy? Do they see Hamas as a tool of Israel that has been used to justify, to paint all of Palestine as violent and justify uh, the invasion? So in Dan Cohen and Max Blumenthal's Killing Gaza documentary, which is the only documentary I know of really from inside Gaza that's, you know, like an hour and a half long, you know, they're going and they're visiting families whose all the children have missing limbs and then they go and they take footage of somebody getting shot by an Israeli sniper and they go and like, you know, do a tour of bombed out neighborhoods. But then toward the end, they, um, what was it? They sort of take refuge, I think, in some, some house in Gaza. And they just sort of, I think, randomly stumble upon some teenage guys, Palestinian kids in Gaza. And they're sort of in this house and the cameras are going, this is in the video. This is in the documentary. And they just start smoking weed. They pull out a joint, start smoking weed, doing drugs. And I think Max has actually talked about this. I think there's just a lot of drugs going on in Gaza for a lot of good reasons. But the availability, I think, is there for the most part. Um, so do I think the average Palestinians in Gaza are hip to like the the deal between Netanyahu and Qatar, which funneled a billion dollars to Hamas? And I mean... Maybe. I don't know. I mean, there is a whole lot of political propagandistic education going on inside of Gaza for, again, obvious reasons. If you're under siege, I think you would, too, do that with your population. But um, and so they're more politically sophisticated in that in that way, I would guess. Again, I've never been there. I don't know. But yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think most of those people I think the vast majority of people I have ever come into contact with in any country, anywhere in the world, they've all been, you know, the vast majority, more than 90% have been disinterested totally in politics mm -hmm. and mostly interested in having a good time, <laughs> you know, like, and so I think people in Gaza are probably the same and they happen to be in the worst possible place on earth to have a good time, but they're doing their best. And I think drugs are essential. Like if you have nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and you hear bombs all night long and drones 24 seven overhead. We should, I would be all for sending drugs to those people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, yeah. Uh, we got 15 minutes left. I want to talk about, uh, the FISA warrant or the FISA renewal. Yeah. And internal turmoil amongst the, did Republican. you hear it? I mean, did you hear the latest, latest news? Uh, it's, no, it, it went down. Yeah, I saw it went down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 19, 19 Republicans voted against, and that's what mm -hmm. did it. And they are being referred to as the Chaos Caucus. MAGA. They are, yeah. MAGA. Yeah. It's M MTG and company, right? Same people. Mm -hmm. And like F Massey and, you know, the actually like decent civil libertarians and stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, I bring this up because uh, Ben Shapiro has been railing against them on his show. He's he's been the one calling them the Chaos Caucus, and uh, yeah. yeah, he says it makes no sense that they would get rid of Kevin McCarthy, and then they get an even more conservative quote unquote speaker, and then they go against him. And it, he's frustrated that the Republicans won't govern. He's frustrated that they're jeopardizing Ukraine aid. He thinks the Ukraine project is good. Um, yeah. It, it, as a Ben Shapiro conservative, but he's a neocon, but yeah. So yeah. this is a huge divide on the right right now. Um, and it's, I think it's jeopardizing uh, mainstream Republican support for Trump. And it's uh, whether or not Trump will get his base, whether or not he'll get his old base. Cause uh, the Israel thing is a huge split. The foreign policy thing is a huge split. And uh, the lack of coherency is, Getting these divisions, man. So sorry to keep coming back to this, but it really is this important. Um, uh -huh. Israel issue, not Gaza, but Israel generally. Yeah. Turns out. And I sort of knew this, like in the back of my mind, I kind of had seen this way back, but I didn't really think about it. But really, the Israel issue now has revealed, I'm sorry to say, 
the MAGA movement as totally fraudulent from the beginning because it turns out not, I don't mean to say, I mean, there are certainly MAGA people who I think are true America first anti-interventionists for sure, but I'm talking about the leaders mm -hmm. and I'm going to start with the leader leader, not Donald Trump, my boy, Steve Bannon, Max Blumenthal brought it to our attention recently on a live stream. And I just, I knew this, but I forgot about it. But in 2007, I think it was, Andrew Breitbart mm -hmm. and Steve Bannon went to Israel and had a meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. And there's pictures of this and of stories about this. And with his blessing, started what they said would be a pro-Israel right-wing outlet in the United States of America. That became Breitbart. It began, amazingly, as a pro-Israel project, Breitbart. And Breitbart, of course, was the intellectual hub of the whole MAGA movement. The beginning of the MAGA movement, the first two years, people forget this, but the whole Trump movement, MAGA movement, was all around Breitbart. Breitbart, Breitbart was providing all of the ideas, and that's why Bannon... That's exactly why Bannon became Trump's av advisor in the White House. Um, that was where they got the ideas for what Trump would be and what he would do and what MAGA is and what nationalist populism is and all this was Breitbart. And that fucking project, Breitbart was Jewish, not just Jewish, but a super Zionist. And I'm telling it was I'm not telling you this is known. It's there. It began and you can see it in their language is that we are going to be a pro-Israel anti-left wing like pro-israel was like the first thing they said mm -hmm. about their purpose their reason for being and so therefore the whole like hyper zionist policies of trump led by jared kushner moving the embassy to jerusalem etc the abraham accords are actually very very pro-israel and anti-palestinian um that's all jared you know but trump let him do that i mean so it's because the whole movement from the get-go for God's sake, was created by the Israel lobby. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus this is, Christ. This is relevant, <laughs> this is relevant right now. I want to show this clip. This is relevant right now uh, because Trump's... Uh, ben Shapiro has been fundraising for Trump openly. Like oh. In 2016, Shapiro op openly really? opposed Trump. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. And said, yeah. And uh, Trump's biggest donor right now is Miriam Adelson, uh, the widow of Sheldon Adelson. Correct. So, and uh, I wish they would be more anti Semitic. They're supposed to be anti Semitic, but they're not. Right. I mean, like, this that's the funniest thing about the charge that they're anti, which was always hilarious, right? The charge but, that he's Hitler, yeah. <laughs> that they're, well, no, that they're anti Semitic specifically. It's been said yeah. many times. I'm like, um, just the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, Although, Although Zionism is anti-Semitic, but that's another level we don't have to get to. Israel situation. He has abandoned Israel. He's totally abandoned Israel. And frankly, you know, he's a low IQ individual. He has no <laughs> idea where he is supporting. He doesn't know he's supporting the Palestinians, but he knows one thing. He is not supporting Israel. He has abandoned Israel. And any Jewish person that votes for a Democrat or votes for Biden should have their head examined. Biden has and then yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Trump is here's a, is a, mm -hmm. here's Ben Shapiro, his 15 minute explanation as to why he's hosting a fundraiser for Donald oh, Trump. Oh wow, March 15th. Yeah, didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Incredible. People, people on the right, people on the left, will just throw all of their principles right out the window because of Israel. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. They just, and not just Jewish people. I mean, you know, I, I have multiple friends who are classical liberals, right? They believe in like equal rights, equality under the law, civil rights for everyone, the bill of rights, freedom of speech for everyone, the vote for they, they that's they are right. And, but except for Palestinians, mm -hmm. they don't No, we can't give them. We can't give those people those rights because they misuse them. It's amazing. Like everyone in the world, like the people of Iraq and Afghanistan should have civil rights. 
everyone in the world should have them. You know, we're all for that. Gosh, we love the Bill of Rights so much, but not the Palestinians. No, they can't have that. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, black South Africans, the ANC in the 1980s and 90s, they were fucking murdering civilians every day torturing and murdering civilians every day terrorist campaigns they blow up shopping malls just like the palestinians did mm -hmm. to pro to protest apartheid and none of us said oh god those people are such barbarians we are we're for continuing apartheid we got to keep it that's what they're saying that's yeah. what my friends are saying about israel and Pal and gaza it's just amazing it's like wait the answer to the whole thing is give those people civil rights are you kidding? And they're like, oh, no, we can't do that. Because if you gave them all the civil rights and all the shit that they're actually demanding, then I think they'll stop blowing you up. I really do. But let's try that. It's like, oh, no, we can't give them civil rights. No, 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 because they're such savages. The mm -hmm. same thing was said about slavery in the United States. Those people are savages. We can't, like, bring them out of slavery and let them be free because mm -hmm. they're savages. They, they'll rape our women. I mean, it's the same argument over and over again. But my very enlightened friends who are libertarians and civil libertarians, often big free speech people. All about equality under the law, really good on criminal justice in the United States. They don't like the cops. But when it comes to Palestinians, oh, no, those people are such savages. We can't give them any of those rights that otherwise we're all for. The contradictions. That this issue finds in people and exposes in people is remarkable and often we find out unfortunately that it comes down to some ideas about race or some assumptions about race it is there is so much racism being expressed around this issue and it's like what the blm has been saying for years actually is true when it comes to American and Western perceptions of Palestinians and Arabs in general. I mean, it's so hard to cut through the racist assumptions. They think that Palestinians like it when their babies are killed. They say this. It's I mean, like, wow, okay. That's not what I've seen. I have not seen mothers rejoicing when their babies are blown up. You guys mm -hmm. seen that? <laughs> have uh, you seen any ha happy mothers with dead babies in their arms i haven't seen that yet sorry to bring this uh to uh horse race 2024 politics again but is it actually given the two options trump and biden on this one issue isn't it actually potentially better to support biden on this because it seems like he'll have to answer to the left the far left of his base more so than Trump will have to answer to the Nick Fuentes of his base. <laughs> and that, uh, yeah. I don't know. So Trump, when he wins, if he wins, mm -hmm. if he's not in jail, I know for sure if the war is still going on or if it's still sort of a hot conflict, which it probably will be in November or whenever January, He's going to fly to Tel Aviv immediately. He's going to sit down with Bibi Netanyahu one-on-one, -on -one, and he's going to try to work out a deal. I know this. Now, just like he did with North Korea, that's his style, right? And I can tell he's sort of raring to do that and sort of be the big, so he can be the big hero. Because ultimately, it's all about, you know, making him the good guy, his ego. The question is, though, what leverage will he bring to that discussion when he tells Bibi to stop the war? Like, what will Bibi say? You know, what will he say when Bibi says, well, what are you going to give to us? What do we get for that? And that's just, I don't know. But Trump has to come up with something real that he can offer Netanyahu. But I think that is what's probably going to end this war is when Trump gets elected and cuts a deal with Netanyahu, meaning it could be another year or 10 months, nine months more of this. But I actually do think that. Um, I think Trump is is probably figuring out plans and maybe even talking to people. But he has to have, he has to give Netanyahu something, meaning some kind of security guarantee or something. I don't know. My guess is knowing Trump, knowing his proclivities, that he's going to promise some hit jobs on Hamas leaders, maybe. The guys living in Doha. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. keep hearing about you know who live in the four seasons of doha it's like okay if you guys know where they live why haven't you killed these fucks aren't they the leaders what's going on here hmm are we really trying to kill hamas why are there no commandos in the four seasons i keep hearing that these guys live there but not one attack on them weird um you'd think it's about collective punishment instead of actually taking out hamas but anyway i think that trump might offer something like that heads on stakes maybe um because no one would be mad about that, right? If the Navy SEALs mm -hmm. went in and took out some but Hamas dudes. Would it potentially, I, I see it probably being like a temporary deal, a la the Abraham Accords that would collapse within a few years and we'd be back to square one, potentially. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, so long as those people are denied their civil rights and are behind a wall and barbed wire and are occupied by troops in the West Bank, yeah, it's going to continue. I mean, I'm sorry. Like, that's just... A straight up objective, un unless they stop being human beings who accept living like that. I mean, hello, everybody. Like, this is not sustainable. There will be this as long as that's going on. The end of this is not the destruction of Hamas. The end of this is the destruction of apartheid and occupation, guys. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not happening. They're, they're announcing more settlements. They not announced. They just seized more. Israeli government just seized a huge, I forget. A thousand or hundreds of acres of land again in the West Bank. Not it's not their land. It's illegal and putting settlers on it who are fanatics or religious fanatics who want to kill all the Palestinians. I'm not kidding. That's what they say. This is headed for. I mean, it's just a cataclysm until these people realize you got to give those people freedom in the vote. Sorry. And if that means you got to leave, so be it. Ask the United States to hook you up and give you some money to resettle, which is what I'm all for. Mm -hmm. a bill in Congress to take money from the funding we give to Israel and establish a fund for the resettlement of Israelis elsewhere. I understand Israelis laugh at me when I say this right now. I mean, on Twitter, they laugh at me and they send me pictures of how great life is in Israel in Tel Aviv and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I know it is right now for sure. No, it's a great place to live right now. I get it. You guys are partying hard, <laughs> but I just don't see how it's sustainable given that Americans now hate your ass. Like a majority of us do not want to fund you do not want to support you and it's going to be an advantage for politicians in this country to be anti-israel now this will be the, the yeah this is what what's going to happen watch you will see there will be people campaigning for congress in the next cycle who come out against israel funding israel and they will get votes for that reason this will be the first time that's ever happened so and it's going to happen and that means the thing is you're on borrowed time then. Once that starts to happen, once you have people in Congress, in the government who want to defund the thing, and that grows, then you're on your own. And that means you're dead. You got to leave. Mm -hmm. Or, no, you don't have to leave. You have to give those people civil rights. That's your choice. You leave or you give those people civil rights or you go to war and probably die on your own. Um, once we pull out. Uh, six months of this shit yeah uh one more thing on biden is that he has quote considering uh pardoning julian assange or dropping the charges oh yeah throwing out the prosecution yeah which Damn. um i don't know if that really means anything or if he <laughs> it is yeah it does if he says yeah. that that if means he a says lot. that yeah that, that means a huge he thing means shifted. i didn't mm -hmm. know this that's huge what well, does yeah. it mean he doesn't necessarily mean he'll follow through, but it means some some massive shift just happened in the White House. They got some something happened in the White House to make them change their mind on that massive issue because they've never, ever been interested in that. Obama wanted to hang his ass, basically. Um. So, yeah. All right. We should go, though. Dope. All right. But um. so unregistered live, if you want to hang out with me on Zoom and all the patrons. All the friends of the show, we hang out for an hour, hour and a half after this every Thursday. Go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Become a patron at any level. Click the URL link right there on Patreon and join us in the room where I'm going right now. Michael, thank you so much, dude. Yep. This was great. Sweet. Well done. Um, uh, we've done a course in the past on black exploitation. I'm going to yeah. play us out with a clip of a black exploitation film. 
uh, that OJ starred in in 1974. This is just the trailer, but Renegade History, yeah. Unregistered Academy. Go to Unregistered Academy. Check out the Ren Renegade History course. Second sessions next week. We have three more to go. So check it out. You can also stream the videos. Let's nope. go. Yeah. Uh, how, how far did you get last night? Sorry, I, I need to check out the stream. Just, just through the revolution. Just, through, so, just chapter yeah. one? Next week is the slavery and reconstruction. Slavery. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I got to be there for that. <laughs> Definitely. So, yep. All right. Cool. See you over there. Peace. Peace. <laughs>